they used to have a commercial say the next voice you hear will be that. <laughs> I want to make sure the last voice I hear on earth is him. I'm thankful to God that he's been so good to me. And you can't tell the goodness of God by judging from the outside. Because you don't know how good God is so you have experienced what he gave you. If you're not experiencing what he gave you, you still don't know how good he is. I think many people today, we have probably done more for God than God done for us. And let me explain that to you. He came and done everything for you, and you trying to outdo what he done for you without accepting what he done for you. This is the problem we're having today in church that most people want to do something for God without recognizing what God has done for them. And that's why we can't be thankful because we don't know what to be thankful for. And that's why many times we'll, we'll spend our life complaining about life because we've never accepted what Jesus came to do for us. And now, and I, you know, every now and then I get in one of those modes where I'll just be still and listen. And I, I'm just amazed at how long it takes us to catch up. <laughs> because God is in the same place he always was. You can run from him. But he'll be right there waiting in the same place where you left him. And most of the time is that we have the idea because we live in an age where, in a time where everybody is really affected by everything around them. We don't know what to be, who to be, how to be, when to be. And most people who have tried to describe God to people imagine that God was like that. We're not sure. Uh, Sometimes we see him, we know he hates bad people. At least we say he does. But he don't. You ain't going to believe this. He loved everybody. And usually when we think he died, he only died for the people that want to be good. No, he didn't. When he died, he died for everybody. And uh, it's easy for me to see why he want to save so much good people. And I can understand that why he want to keep us nice and tight. But you see, the miracle of his salvation, the miracle of him being called a savior, the real question is, can he live up to that? Of course he can. This morning I was thinking, if God don't save nobody, guess what? Ain't nobody going to be saved. There ain't but one in all of our world and world to come that came and claimed to be the Savior. And ain't nobody going to take his place. Nobody. And why a person would want to believe in Jesus, he is your only Savior. I had some people wrote me a letter. I guess they sent a letter out to all over the cater. They want to have a Bible study with me. They don't like the name of Jesus, though. And see, we would run into a problem from the start. I almost took the challenge just so that I could, but I ain't going to do that. There ain't time for that. But I want to I wanna preach this just for a short time. I know some of y'all got turkey and dressing and all that kind of stuff. People thinking about Valentine's Day, eating candy and everything. It's so funny how we define everything. Uh, people define love with the, with the heart and candy. I don't, 
maybe, maybe, I, maybe I'm looking at things wrong. But I would hope that we don't define a Valentine card and a box of candy as love. And I hope to God that we're looking for something greater than a Valentine. Oh, no, Brother Wilson. I didn't say anything was wrong with it. But what's wrong with it is when we begin to think that that's what love is, then that's a problem. Because love is none of that. If you don't get a box of candy, don't get a car. Y'all pardon me. Man, you, you say you love me. Where my car is, my candy. Mm. I don't want no love once a, once a year. If you can't show it all the year round, you don't really have the real love that the Bible talks about. Okay. But I want to preach because I think it's very important what we think and how we think about God. If we don't think the right things about God, we don't get the right results either. And I think sometimes we, we are so into what we think things is, especially after God will tell you what it is. But somehow it doesn't resonate in our thinking in Jeremiah 29 and 11, let me preach this again to you. Because I, let me just read and then you can sit down and I'll preach for the next two hours and then we can go home, all right? Man, people, you say amen when I say that. Don't they? they don't even say amen on that one. <laughs> two hours. It's strange how long we can hear the word of God, but I didn't get up to meddle with it. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know. I wonder if God knows something, can you know more than him? Can we know more than God? You think on our best day we might be able to get one on it? For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. I know. I, I, God said, I know what I'm thinking about you. Have you ever been concerned about what you might have been thinking, what somebody was thinking about you? Have I ever bothered you at one time, wondering what they're thinking about me? It bothers me sometimes. I wonder what they think about me. Real God says, I, I know what I'm thinking about you. I know what I'm thinking about you. I know my thoughts about you. I've been knowing them. It didn't just come up today. You didn't show up today and all of a sudden I had to rethink my thoughts. No. I know what I've been, the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace. How many of you been in turmoil and you wonder, what's he thinking about my peace? Have you ever felt like God didn't care about my peace? My peace of mind? He didn't care about my joy, he didn't care about my strength, he didn't care about. Have you ever felt like maybe he wasn't thinking right? I help you, I have. As a matter of fact, I have even called him on a few things and thought maybe he was getting me mixed up with somebody else. So surely he wasn't thinking about me on that. He said, but my thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. But let me just... Sometimes we read expected end. Let me just explain what that means to us. 
That word means that he given us an expected attachment, a cord that draws us. Already worked it out. Some of you are trying to figure out how to work it out. He really has it all worked out. Precious God, I do thank you today for helping us in this journey. Speak to our minds and hearts today. Relieve us, dear God, of our stress. Lord, speak peace that you have desired for us into our spirits today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Everybody knows what the imagination is. I was sitting there this morning, sitting on the couch, thinking, boy, when I was a kid, I just knew I was going to be a cowboy. I, I never did get the two guns, but I got two sticks. I used to put them in my belt. I just knew I, I wanted to be a cowboy. They, they really mesmerized me, and I just knew what I wanted to be was a cowboy. And then I was sitting laying in the field one day, and laying out there looking out over the highway, and I seen a truck, and I changed my imagination. I said, you know what I said? I'm going to be a truck driver or a bus driver because there's something about them going across the highway that just got my attention. You know, all the things that I imagined as a child, the things that I thought I wanted to be, I outgrew all those imaginations. But I made a lot of decisions based upon my imagination. I went out, I want to see the world. So I saw a sign that says, Uncle Sam wants you. So I imagined myself becoming a soldier. It wasn't quite like I thought it was. It wasn't like the pictures on TV. I got in and then uh, I called home and cried and asked Maine Pearl to call the police to get me away from there because these people are crazy. I didn't imagine all the stuff I had to go through to get in the army. So my life has been filled with different imagination I've had about myself. And each one of them was tied to something that kind of like, uh, even when I got called into the ministry, you know what I thought it was going to be? I told God, I said, now God, you know I like to travel. So I don't know but one of those gifts in the ministry that let you travel. I said, I know what you're calling me to be. You're calling me to be an evangelist. I remember the first uh, revival I preached was a whole week. And I preached with my friends, so we preaching every other day. I preached about four times that week. And about died for a whole week. I couldn't hardly move. So I thought, maybe God, I'm not an evangelist. Because I can't see myself preaching five days a week, every week of the month, and recuperate. So I put that on the back burner. So I'm always trying to imagine God from my imagination, trying to figure out what God wants to do because I have imagined things in my own life. Right? And we all have those. And I would hope to God that you do have some type of imagination. Be it good or bad, but you have an imagination. Sometimes we have to know what is not because before we can know what it is. You know, we, we have lived so long in, in a lot of negativity. Our world is filled with it. Ain't nothing right no more. And, it, and there's something wrong with everything in the world today. And so we, we, we live so long like this in that right now we need to look at ourselves and imagine what do you think God imagination is about you? Because I don't think that he's seeing you like the world sees you. And I don't think he knows you like the world knows you. I think what he sees in his mind about you, like he said, I, 
I, I see peace. I, I want to, I, I have judged you. I've given you, want you to have peace. Nothing could have been more unimaginable right now in most people's lives that God has his imagination for you is to give you peace and look like every day the only thing coming our way is not peace. But we will spend more time embracing what is not for us than embracing what God sent for us. You'll talk to people, they can tell you about more of their problems than they can about their promises. They can tell you all the bad things that's going on, but not hardly any good thing happened. And so here we are, God understanding that we imagine, our imagination can either help us or it's going to hurt us. Either it's going to bring you into a place where God has called you to, or you're going to miss everything God has for you because you're living in the wrong imagination. Oh, hallelujah. God knows that, you know, the first thing that happened to man in the garden was his imagination got messed up. Somehow, in our world today, every young boy, you did not have an imagination of being a superstar. Because we are flaunted with so much stardom. Nobody really imagined himself just being an ordinary creature anymore. Either I imagine myself being a movie star or some big guru somewhere uh, in my big yacht on a little island sipping coconut, water out of coconuts, Laying back in my hammock, white sand on the beach. Man, see that imagination? That's me. I imagine myself leisurely enjoying life, waking up every morning, fresh fish out of the sea, all that stuff, just living it up. No, no light bills, no water bills, no rent mortgages. No car payment. How I many you know it's just an imagination? But in the garden, God gave them an imagination that's supposed to match the image they have. God created man in his image. You don't have imagination without an image. And he gave them his imagination in the image. But somehow, something got in there to cause them to imagine more than God had given them. Sometimes we, we need to check ourselves, make sure we're not getting the wrong Im imagination from the wrong places. You know, they, they give commercials today to make you feel like, imagine yourself. I'm taking, I want to start taking Prevagen. That's the uh, jellyfish fins and stuff. They say it's real good for the memory. And he gave a good image of an old guy like me, said how he remembers everything. And he got me almost convinced that maybe I ought to get something. Because we are affected by everything we see. We imagine stuff as they show it to us. They know that. They put that into your spirit, put that into your mind, and all of a sudden you're imagining things. I see one of them. Electric Cadillacs, man, that thing looked like it was, I imagined myself. It never happened in his lifetime, though. But I imagined myself <laughs> riding in that electric car, all the lights, 
God help us. We need to get the right imagination. The enemy convinced Eve that the imagination she had was come, making her come up short. He made her imagine herself being like God with more than God gave her. He said, don't, God said, don't, don't even eat from that tree. Don't, don't eat, don't touch, don't eat. You ever have had the feeling that maybe somebody's keeping something from you? You, you ever thought that maybe God sometimes is keeping things from you? You ever felt like that? Why well, have? I felt like, man, you, you ain't let me enjoy what they enjoy. Well, y'all got off quiet. Now you need to be in trouble with God. You might as well tell it. I, me and him talk like that. And I will tell him, Lord, <laughs> you keeping something from me? So Eve said, you know what? This stuff that I'm going to imagine myself eating is going to make me wiser. Could I tell you there is no greater wisdom than the wisdom that God gives you. I, I want to tell you this here, because most people are afraid to pray for it, and God tell you, if you lack it, all you got to do is ask for it. And the wisdom of God is not like the wisdom of this world. All you have to do is ask God, pray, God, give me wisdom. Well, you know, I, I didn't even go past the third grade. Wisdom is not about what grade you went to. Huh? God's wisdom was before third grade. <laughs> God had wisdom before he had schools. And when he gave us the Holy Ghost, you ain't going to believe what he downloaded in you when he put the Holy Ghost in you. And most people don't trust the Holy Ghost is in them. God put his wisdom with the Holy Ghost in you. That's why it's imperative that we learn how to be led by his spirit. But his wisdom is never going to look like the world's wisdom. See, I know what the world says, and I know how the world wisdom works. But that's not like God. And so here they are. They got one language in one place, got one God, one tongue, and somehow they perverted the imagination of God. She thought as if he ate that, that she'd be a better judge of what's good and what's evil. Could I tell you, when you become the best judge, you've lost your ability to be the best witness. Because once you become the best judge, you can never be a witness. I've never seen in any courtroom where the judge got on the witness stand. So you disqualify yourself to be a witness to God if you have made yourself the judge. Because God never imagined you being the judge. He imagined you being a witness and the witness to what he has downloaded in you. And God knew that the decadence of the imagination will take them to places they never wanted to go. And matter of fact, he said, man, their imagination is so messed up that anything, them, if I don't do something, Whatever they imagine to do, they'll get it done. How, how many of y'all spent your life trying to live up to your imagination? How many lived up to the imagination only to find out the imagination they lived up to left them empty? 
because the imagination you had was not the imagination God had for you. And then it went on in Genesis 6. He talked about the weakness of man, how great it was in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, have I ever been in a time that I really feel like people are living in some bad imagination? It's right now. I'm not going to go on with that because i got to leave that alone. But image has a lot to do with our perception of how we see God. We either see him as being our savior or we see him as being a savior that needs our help. I don't see Jesus as a savior that needs my help. I see him as a savior all by himself that's able to save to the uttermost. And there's no weakness in his salvation whatsoever. See, what happened is that pride is what causes us to pervert what really belongs unto the Lord. It perverts our praise. Because if we're not careful, we want more praise than we give to God. Have to be real careful. We want more praise for us and less praise for God. We have to be real careful in this starlit area where then they sing and know you're drinking your own Kool-Aid and you're thinking that you are more than what God called us to be. You know what he saw when he looked into the world? When he came into this world, you know what he knew? He knew there was not one person, not one. I look for a man. <laughs> Guess what? He looked all over the world. Not that he had to look. But he said, I, I couldn't find nobody, not one. And since I couldn't find nobody to take the job, my own arm took it. I bore it. I'm the only one that could take the job, qualified for it. There wasn't one man that was born as good as they were, was ever good enough to be your savior. Because the image that we bore, the image that we had before we got with God, it was a decadent image. Everything about the image of man, and even Jesus, shows us, shows us that image is what shapes our destiny. If you bear this image, he shows you the destination for that. Jesus took this image and took it to the cross. You know what he was telling you? Everything that looked like this, it's got to die. And there's another image that was being created in you is the only image that brings light. Your image attracts what it's about. Your image attracts what it's about. Every image has a destination. You know, I, I, you have to be careful who you want to be like. That's why I, I know I, I people think I'm mad and crazy, but I, I love people. But I haven't seen anybody I want to be like. I love people. But I haven't seen anybody walking in shoe leather like me that I have went and said, oh, man, I wish I could be like them. No, I do not. 
because I don't know what the image is going to attract later on. Let me deal with my image right here, knowing that our images are attracting things to us. And if we're bearing the wrong image, guess what is being attracted to us? Wrong stuff. And you're wondering why. Why do I keep having to go through this? Because of the image you may be wearing. It may be because what you're trying to be is attracting what's coming to you. There is an image. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians it says, we have borne the image of the earthy. That's this. And you know what this image have attracted? Earthly stuff. Matter of fact, it make me want earthly stuff. So all this image have done, my earthly image has made things that earthly be a, attracted to me. Oh, I'm attracted to it. You can tell which image you're walking in by what you're attracted to. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. I mean, if, you, if you, you love certain things, I mean, let's get it real. I don't think God put you in this earth with all these things in here and you can't enjoy none of them. I don't believe that. But knowing how to enjoy them and how much to enjoy them is one thing we fail with. Because most of the things that we get and we call them blessings, they become curses later because those things that we pray so hard for, when we get them, we don't need God no more. Then we quit praying then. We don't pray about it again until it messes up. And then all of a sudden now we want to get in prayer about it. See, our earthly image has an assignment. Our heavenly image also has an assignment. Jesus came in the likeness. If I said likeness. Say, likeness ain't sameness. But he came in the likeness of sinful flesh to show you the assignment. Because he, being God, really came to die. But he came in the likeness of sinful flesh to show you the assignment of flesh. And he took that flesh all the way to Calvary. Because that was it. It behooves me. But it must do this. Because I come in the likeness of sinful flesh, I need to show you the assignment of it so that when he got up, he didn't send you back flesh, did he? What did he send back? The Holy Ghost. Because that was going to be the new image that he wanted you to bear. He said, now we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. The Holy Ghost is the image of the heavenly. So he sent you back the Holy Ghost, not just with an image, but with an assignment. There are things the Spirit does that the flesh can do. There are things that God does in the Spirit that the flesh could never do. This flesh assignment is not peace. This flesh assignment is all about tribulations. <laughs> it's all about problems, sickness. No matter how, how well you stay, you know, I never did get to walking and doing all that stuff. I did try it a couple of times. Did buy some tennis shoes. Walked a while. But I ain't going to lie to you. After, after I, I missed about two days and I just decided that I done done enough of that. I did. I, I went and bought, I, I was doing good in old tennis shoes, but I went and bought some new ones. And I think after I bought them new tennis shoes, I still got them walking suits in the closet now. And I went fishing with the tennis shoes. See, I done all my walking when walking wasn't cool. Y'all wonder why I'm in shape? I was walking cotton fields. <laughs> I 
I know that's foreign to people. Cotton meal. Yeah, I was walking cotton fields with a cotton sack. Don't seem like it's been that long ago, but it's been a long while. Eating bologna sandwich on crackers and drinking knee-high pop. I was getting things done early in life. So see all these people who didn't do nothing, they out of shape right now. I get thinking about all that walking I done. When I pass the park and see them doing that, I know they ain't done nothing. I've been there. I don't plan on doing that no more. Well, brother, you, you need to walk. No, I don't. I'm walking. I walk to the car. And every now and then I might run. But I'm not getting, you ain't going to see me in the park doing all that stuff. Because until you can prove to me that it's adding another day to my life, I'm through with that stuff. That's over. Anyway, have you ever looked at yourself? You ain't got to answer to nobody but you. Have you ever looked at yourself and just tried to imagine how does God see me? Have you ever looked at yourself and imagined how pleased God is with you? Because I believe over 90% of the people that are saved doesn't have a good imagination of themselves in God. They are never certain of how pleased God is with them. And so in that, the imagination of God in their life is kind of messed up. You know, I, I know over the years I've heard many stories and problems and, and marriages and all that. You know what the keys to all that was? When one and the other thought they, the other wasn't pleased with them. And once you start thinking somebody ain't pleased with you, your imagination start getting in overtime. Man, you start seeing things you ain't never seen before in your life. You start interpreting every little thing that you see as something totally against you. Most people live in such a negative mindset because their imagination is messed up. They can't, they can't imagine a God. They can't imagine Jesus loving them. And part of the reason why is because they haven't really accepted his love for their life. When the Bible says that God loves unconditionally, when he talks about he really means unconditionally. See, I, I have a problem with that myself. Because if I try to love you with this image right here, I'm going to have a problem with that unconditional stuff. But if I allow his image that he has formed in me, be the leading force in my life, then I have no problem allowing that Holy Ghost to be the unconditional imagination in my life. Because I can't believe that God is going to love somebody else, but he can't love me. Have you ever felt that maybe God loves somebody else more than he loves you? Have you ever imagined yourself Hoping, praying that God would somehow love me like he loved them. Well, we got to come back to Calvary again and realize that was for you. Mm -mm. That was for you. He, it wasn't, he didn't put you in the whole block and, and put you in a little group over here, but each, that death, that one death was a death for every man. And to show you that he loved every man, he died for all. Well, I don't think God loved me. He can't love you any more than he loves you now. 
He can't save you any more than he saved you now. He can't give you any more peace than he's given you now. If you allow the Holy Ghost in your life to be the image of your life, it will attract everything heaven has to offer you. It'll bring peace to your life. It'll, peace will follow you. You won't have to look for it because the Holy Ghost in you is the spirit of peace. It attracts peace. Man, we try to live life attracting things through these images and have our earthly images and having a whole lot of earthly problems. Then we want God to straighten out our earthly problems when all the time he only came to give you a heavenly answer. He only came to build the image of the heavenlies in you. Now that you're born there. You see, but then he says, the assignment for all earthly images. The assignment was death, hell, and the grave. Have you ever wondered why he came to conquer death, hell, in the grave because that was your earthly assignment. But he came to handle the, your earthly assignment in your likeness. He came in your likeness to take care of the assignment that was assigned to you. See, we don't rejoice because he got up, but we should. It's old hat to us now that he died on Calvary, but we should be awfully excited about that. Because he did, I don't have to. He done what I, what I couldn't do. He did it, and then turned around, and, oh, you, he's so good. He turned around and gave me something I don't even deserve. You didn't deserve any of this. He said, but I'm going to restore. I'm going to redo this. I'm going to give you a new image. I'm going to pour my spirit in you. That's my image in you. Sometimes we have done God an injustice because we make statements that don't make sense. I'm going to live for God. He didn't ask you to live for him. He wants you to live with him. Well, brother, we'll I still going to live for God. That's the reason why you're having a problem because you're trying to do something only he can do in you. God wants to live through you. And that way, your son, your flesh assignment is still dead. No matter how much Holy Ghost you get in you, Quit boasting the image that you had when you were born into this world and start thinking about the image that God is creating in you. You need to start uh, hooking up with more of what heaven has for you than what earth has. And sometimes we are excited about the earthly things that we might get, but friend, you're going to leave all this earthly stuff and all them heavenly assignments that God has placed in your life. Man, you won't enjoy that for all eternity. Oh, hallelujah. I'm tired of being happy one day and sad the next. I'm tired of being up and then down the next day. Huh? Do you think that's the Holy Ghost? Do you think it's the Holy Ghost that, that caused me to mourn over things that, I, that don't make sense? Do you think the Holy Ghost leads you into depression? No. That's that old image trying to give you another assignment. And you'll know, I see people working on them flesh assignments all their life and still never get into it done. And all we have is what Jesus said today. If you hear my voice and harden not your heart, today 
I got an assignment. You know, you, you, you wouldn't put in, you know, God didn't create you for chaos. He said, my thoughts for you. Man, I, I put you in my imagination. All my thoughts have been for you. Man, I just want to bring you peace. I just want to give you peace. I don't have no evil thoughts about you at all. I'm going to ask you one question before we close. Have you ever sit down and imagine that maybe God was sending some bad stuff your way, evil stuff, because of you? He said, man, my thoughts never was about evil. Not for you. I never thought like that. Black cat ran across the street the other day in front of my car. I know y'all think, y'all want to hear me say I ran over it. But I ain't going to say that over this pulpit and have the police come and get me. But the black cat ran across my path the other day. And uh, it's almost like something in the car said, bad luck. Well, first of all, I don't believe in bad luck or good luck. But you know, my upbringing, sometimes I had to fight against some of the imagination of our upbringing. Dad, don't walk in that ladder. Ooh, we're going to turn around and go back, black cat. The only thing I can say for the cat, maybe he believed in luck, and it was his lucky day. <laughs> Somebody probably still feeding him cat food today. But they, all, they almost lost a dependent. How many of y'all believe y'all may be in some bad luck or something? I know you ain't going to raise your hand. How many of y'all feel like y'all being punished? Just keep looking this way. Nobody knows it's but you and God and the devil. Because he, he, he wants to tell you your assignment, you, you, you earned it. <laughs> right? He'll remind you of all the things and why you earned this bad luck. And why God is against you. I don't see God being against anybody. And if God be for you, he's more than all the world. Come on, Sam, I've got to let you go. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected connection. That word Expected end means a card, an attachment. That in the end, you're going to be hooked to me. I already know. I've imagined it. I've seen it. You're expected end. You're going to be connected to me. <laughs> and here you are. You're trying to figure it out. Your imagination is working overtime trying to figure out how you're going to do the attachment. You ain't got to worry about God. He speak things that are not as though they were. And those things that were will be like he spoke. I don't know how he does the attaching, the car. I have no idea. All I can do is look at what he said. I, I, I got an expected end for you. And here you are today wondering how you're going to be saved. He said, I already got the end. I expected the end. I'm going to send you peace and not evil. 
Boy, I wish this week that we started embracing the peace of God. I wish this week we start just praying, Lord, thank you for the peace of God. Now, you have connected me to this peace that I haven't had in my life in a while. Some of you need to find that today. See, it's not what you think about you that matters more than what, it, what he thinks about you. Do you think your imagination is going to trump the imagination of God? Do you think that somehow he thought something up that you're going to overpower that? I don't know how God does what he does. I, I have no idea. I wish I knew more about him, but I don't know that much about him. I don't know how he could look and see all this stuff down through the age. I don't know how it didn't surprise him and you didn't either. And even I heard some people say one time, man, man, I, I wasn't even supposed to be born. Yes, you was. You was. <laughs> if you was born, guess why you was born? Because you were supposed to be born. He planned for you. He imagined you being whole. Do you know what the word whole means? Do you understand what the word whole is? We just sung one, make me whole. Do you know what whole means? God, please, make us whole. I'm tired of putting Band-Aid on yesterday's wounds. I'm tired of looking at myself and seeing the scars, the scabs. When he makes you whole, he makes you so complete, even the scars are gone. He has imagined that. He imagined you living in peace. He imagined you living in health, in healing. He imagined you living in victory. Where is your victory? Maybe I shouldn't say where it is. Who is? And it's about time we started calling on our victory. I call on Jesus. Why? He is. My all of heaven and earth understand that name. That's why at the sound of that name, every knee, every knee has to bow. When we have the faith in that name, every knee has to bow. The imagination of God is in that name. Things he had imagined for you. And so when I want victory, I call on it. Do I have to see it to believe it? No. I'm living in his imagination. Who has already seen it. What I can't see, he's seen already. What I can't do, he's done already. Where, I, where I'm going, he's already there. <laughs> Let's pray together today, precious God. Oh, we thank you. I thank you for the imagination that you have placed in my heart. Imagine it. Living in your peace and your health, your goodness, your mercy. Imagine it. God, your wisdom that you've given us, imagine Lord, the victory that we find in the name of Jesus, imagine our healings in Jesus' name today. Lord, I pray, breathe on us one more time. Lord, begin to work on that new image that we have in our new birth. And we'll give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In victory, we call on Jesus today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've already done. Praise you, Lord God, today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.